studies and uh, LGBTXYZ studies that ha I think are responsible for a lot of our problems. Uh, Miranda, seeing I'm the deplorable <laughs> baby boomer, thank you. <laughs> Well, it shows there are some wonderful deplorable baby boomers. I would say that everybody in this room would be one or you wouldn't be here. You'd be often teaching one of those Marxist social studies courses. Um, so, well, look, I, I, I don't understand why governments um, fund these ridiculous courses. If you listen to Jordan Peterson, which I'm sure everybody, every young conservative here would know a lot about Jordan Peterson and watch his YouTube videos, he just talks about how this, uh, you know, identity politics, this crazy new form of Marxism is treated as a joke by all of us, but it's had a long incubation in universities. And if you remember, Safe Schools in Victoria was uh, started by um, uh, well, the architect of that was a woman called Ros Ward, who's an actual Marxist. Uh, in La Trobe Universities, um, they've got some department that deals with all that stuff. So um, I, I just think there was a slight glimmer of something good um, last week with the Liberal Party, with Simon Birmingham, of all people, who's on the left, but he actually um, cut very minorly, but actually rejected the some grants to some really crazy um, research projects but you know it was, it was a tiny amount tiny little gesture and yet the screams that went up about you know this is interfering with scientific freedom well Donald Trump has shown that you just don't care about those screams right. they mean nothing and it's what Danny told us as well you know they scream and carry on and that they're like you know their bark is worse than their bite the left uh, and the media that obviously, you know, much of the mainstream media amplifies uh, their screams, uh, particularly the ABC and Fairfax, if the ABC is still here. But um, so, but if you ignore them, nothing happens. Look at Donald Trump. It's an outrage every day against the left and he just keeps on winning and they whip themselves into a fury. But so what? You know, sensible people win. And if you are in government and you don't push back against this craziness, then the silent majority is going to judge you very poorly. And I think that defunding some of these insane projects would be a good start. <clears throat> Next question. Uh, this question is for any one of you. Uh, what effect, if any, has the Kavanaugh incident had on the conservative movement in Australia? Because we know that there's been a bit of a swing towards the Republicans after what happened to Justice Kavanaugh. So I was wondering if that's had an effect here in Australia on our movement. Rather than getting everybody to, we'll just get one, try and get one person to answer each question. I'll, I'll uh, tip into it. I'm not sure you can, you'll notice that there's a direct effect except there's now an awareness of it and the ability to call out some of the nonsense that is peddled. Uh, there is a proclivity that if an allegation is made against a conservative, it is instantly believed uh, by the media and they've got to defend it and explain themselves all the time. Whereas if you're a major party leader and there's allegations of, uh, of impropriety there, um, if you're not a conservative, uh, you will be given the benefit of the doubt. No one should discuss it until the police investigation is, is concluded. It's double standards extraordinary, but... Uh, I, I take say echo what Miranda said. Donald Trump didn't waver in his defence of Justice Kavanaugh, um, even though there were a few lily-livered senators and and um, and uh, Republican Congress people uh, that that went into to advocate against him uh, because of these unfounded allegations. The system kind of worked, albeit it's come at a heavy price for him and his family. So the lesson that I've taken out of it is that. Uh, we are going to sink into a, a deeper swamp, I think, um, in maybe not this next election, but the one after that, if, if particularly if the shortened government gets in and they're emboldened by the Greens and, and a crossbench that doesn't believe what they have any, any limits. And if that's the case, then we are going to find ourselves subject to exactly the same sort of smears and allegations. Um, it is uh, an obligation to push back as hard as we can. So... But that's the only lesson we can take out of it. America is just five or maybe ten years ahead 
of where we're going to end up and uh, I think that should fill us with dread. Uh, sorry, my question is regarding free speech and with the fact that free speech around the rest of the world is slowly being killed off, do you think we'll ever get anything like a First Amendment for Australia or do you think that we're just too far gone to get that? No, you go. Yeah. Um, look, free speech is under under threat, but I also think it's come back to a point where where you, we're starting to to see the tide turn a little bit. We've had universities actually acknowledge that that they need to allow free speech on campus. Now that's a start. Um, do I ever see a First Amendment? No, in, in this country. Uh, just like I don't see the Human Rights Commission disappearing at any any point in time and, and the Human Rights Commission and the fact that you can be charged with something for offending someone suggests that you don't truly have freedom of speech and uh, I try not to be selective in it. Uh, the fact is that I'll, I'll, if someone says something that I don't like, I say it's a disgrace, they should be, you know, whatever, hauled over the coals over it because there's consequences to it. It doesn't mean you shouldn't be able to, to say what you want to say just because it's it's vile and grotesque. If it breaches the law, you know, defamatory or something like that, that's another story. But um, America is is extraordinary. If you've ever watched American uh, uh, television or American news commentary for a, an extended period of time, you can't believe what they get away with. Um, and that's maybe why so many Americans are just you know, ignore them now and just say it's all, all baloney and bluster. Um, but we need more freedom of speech in this country because the only way you drive out bad ideas is with good ones. I feel like it's a, a respectful version of Q&A where people don't rip each other to threads and not let everyone finish what they're speaking. Um, it's not specifically conservative, but it sort of deals with younger uh, generations. When can we get rid of this preferential voting system? It's ridiculous. Like, people want to know who they're freaking voting for. It's not we vote for a party. We're voting for a person in Australia. We like the person. We like what they stand for. And that's why we're voting for them. And the party encapsulates that. But we've got this ridiculous preferential system that doesn't, you know, who you're voting for now, you know, you don't know who's going to end up going to be in, in, in the position. Yes, they might be on a ballot list and, and have some value. Yeah, I, I got it. Um, <laughs> what, what they're asking you to choose from is the least worst option uh, first and the least bad. And I, I mentioned this last night at a function I was at that it was always very hard for me to choose between Sarah Hansen Young, Penny Wong, <laughs> the Communist Party candidate and Amanda Vanstone, to be honest. But... Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, so I always number below the line, but I struggled in the last four or five. Uh, they returned the favour, trust me. Um, look, it, it's unfortunately it's up to politicians to change it. I, I think I don't think there should be compulsory voting. That's that's a personal thing of mine, um, and I think that you should be able to turn up and vote one for the candidate of your choice, and then if you don't want a preference, well, your vote will exhaust. And the government, federal government in their own interest, it didn't work for them, uh, went some way towards that in the Senate. So you can just vote one in the Senate and your vote will exhaust. They will tell you you have to vote one to six because it's illegal to advertise anything else. But in the essence, the law is if you only vote one or if you vote one, two and three for the parties of your choice, uh, the candidates of your choice, then your vote is still valid until those parties or individuals are eliminated. Why can't that apply to the House of Representatives is, a, is a, just a simple question. But if you want to be cynical about politics, you don't have to look much further than the Queensland State Parliament, where I think you've had optional preferential, compulsory preferential, just vote one, everything is invalid, vote Labor, otherwise it's kicked out, um, and so on. It's just they change it on the whim of, of what they think will give them political advantage. And that's why the preferential system hasn't been changed because the two-party monopoly knows that ultimately you've got to make a choice about who you like, like least, who, who is the least bad of the, of the major party candidates and um, uh, they know that it's going to vest with them. So they don't mind losing a few. They lose a few dollars along the way with the primary vote but they don't mind losing to a few minor parties and in fact they often come and encourage us to run to help them 
And um, I usually politely say no. That's because it's not my it's not my job. I don't I'm not, I don't want to I don't want to be in there to to protect them from their own inadequacies. To be honest, I want to make them better. Very good. <laughs> he wants to hold it. No, you can't hold it. Uh, my question is, is to Corey and to Amanda. A little bit of feedback first. Corey, when I first met you, we went to attended a meeting in Mount Cravat and we had something like 500 people turn up. And then I went to one or two other conservative dudes and got less and less numbers and the performance was never that good. That's a bit of feedback about that. Now, I'm a bit of a Trumpster and a bit of an a, a, a expert in US politics also. And my interest in you when I f was when you first came back from America, you came back talking a little bit like a Trumpster. You came back with that big vision for Australia. And I'm sick and tired of seeing conservatives who seem terribly tepid, always sort of, you know, apologizing for themselves. No, I'll, 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 get, I'll, I'll get there. No, no, that's fine. Thank you. I'm just I'll, going to... Um, I'll, I'll take that as a comment. Oh, no, well, I just wanted to make a comment which I think is important, which is that there is a real problem in this country where people are watching America and watching Donald Trump and they say, yeah, we want that here. It is impossible to do Donald Trump here because, A, we have a compulsory voting system. So you have to, you know, a, a political party has to appeal to 50% plus one. You, you cannot be a Donald Trump in this country. Our system doesn't work that way. Corey is doing exactly what needs to be done to create a sensible, alternative, conservative party that is rational. He can't be Donald Trump because he wouldn't last one minute. Now, you see Clive Palmer and Pauline Hanson are trying to be Donald Trump and Clive Palmer is just, you know, a joke. And Pauline Hanson has a completely incoherent suite of policies that are all over the place. If you're a conservative, she is not your answer. So she's just, a, you know, it's the cult of personality there. So Donald Trump does not exist here. Donald Trump is the Republican Party, he's the leader of the Republican Party and they tolerate him, but that can't happen here. So just... Stop damaging the conservative movement here by pining for something that can never exist. Uh, um, can I just address, you know, you go back to the party's gestation and, and the party, the meeting that we have. Of course, you've got to think that when you start a new political party, that people are enthused about it. We started from scratch and built it to uh, the third largest membership in, in the country. And we're laying a foundation for the future. I make no bones about it. And I don't also make any apology for the fact that, that some people haven't seen the party created in their image and so they're turned off and they run to the next best thing or the next newest thing because a lot of people who get involved in small political parties or start-up political parties are people that have been involved in many, many others and they do it for their own base reasons. It's not for a long-term reason or vision or anything else. Our job is to keep people enthused. But you know, it's interesting. For everyone that emails me and says, we want something to do, and I say, we've got stuff for you to do. You can go letterboxing, you can use our app and go door knocking, you can talk to your friends. How many letters to the editor have you rung? How many Facebook things have you shared? How many of these things? We can, you know, the answers are no. Oh, we haven't done that. I haven't got time to do that. Oh, I don't like doing that. Well, what do you want to do? I want to have a meeting. I want to have a brunch. I want to be president. You know, that's just not how we're running. It's not working. And for, 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 for other parties. And we want to be decentralised. We want people to be to make decisions, to work cooperatively. But we've got no tolerance for, for some of the demands that people put upon us. Right? And it might not be um, everyone's cup of tea, but I, I say this, I get it every week. Why aren't you on radio? Why aren't you on 2GB? And I, my answer is, why don't you listen when I'm on there? <laughs> and it, it sounds flippant, but... but complaining is so easy getting off your butt and actually doing stuff is the hardest thing for people to do particularly now where they think 
liking something on Facebook or, or doing something on Twitter is actually making this, this massive difference. We, we, we need to do our, our business better than others. And um, I'm not going to get the headlines by trying to compromise principles because I think in the long term that will compromise the very reason this party exists. And I reckon, uh, well, I reckon, I reckon there are enough crazy people in the Senate village already. That's the, that's the, that's the reality of it. They, they, they capture a certain element of it because they don't care about the consistency, they don't care about the principle, they don't care about the more hate that comes their way, the more they sort of feed off it. I, I just, that's not how you're going to build a long-term political party. That's my view. And um, uh, I, well, I guess the proof will be in the pudding over the course of time. But, but we, we have a very energised, enthusiastic base. They're very supportive financially. And we've just got to focus all our attentions on getting our, our foundations right so that the next four months or the four months before the election, I expect it will be from Feb, you know, February to May of next year, is where an intensity comes into it like nothing before. Um, but you can't maintain intensity uh, for, for 18 months or two years and then expect to have all the, the building blocks created at the same time. It's just a, it's just a start-up business rule. So I'm sorry if you feel disappointed, uh, but, you know, that's, that's – just part we're going through a process which we're very encouraged about and we've attracted some great candidates uh, we've attracted some good support we're getting credibility and respect in the areas in which we want to do it and um, uh, we just now need to get millions more Australians knowing who the Australian Conservatives are I uh, my question is for Danny. I believe you mentioned Lauren Southern in your speech. Do you think popular right-wing speakers like her, Marla Yiannopoulos, Gavin McInnes, are they actually helping bring young people into conservatism or are they just giving credence to the left that we are angry, nasty, deplorables? I That's interesting. I actually think that they're definitely helping. I mean, in my opinion personally from my friends and that – Provocative is in. If you can be edgy, if you can go against the grain, if you can show people that you're not afraid to do what you believe and to go against what everyone else is saying, it is, it's, people are inspired by it. They like to think, you know, if they can do it, I can do it too. And so I definitely think that people like that, they're willing to challenge the mainstream and they do get a response. They do get the uproar of the crowds. They do get people throwing at them the ugliest of things and they are bringing out a side of left-wing um, protesters that... Okay, they, they always show it, but they, they bring it out even more. And so, you know, and it is brought out to the attention of the young people of, hang on, am I on this smart, witty, provocative side or am I on this emotional, I can't handle what I'm doing and throw a tantrum side? So I definitely do think that they are helping. I mean, they are some of the people that inspired me to get involved and especially watching Lauren Southern in our Cairns tour. I was like, heck yeah, she's onto it. She's cool. I like her. So, yeah, I definitely do think they do help. Uh, firstly, I'd like to apologise to the young people here for dressing in a blue suit. Um, <laughs> if I'd have known what the dress code was, I honestly wouldn't have worn it. Um, but firstly, I'd like to say to the young people here, uh, after 40 years of teaching, how incredibly proud I am as a teacher that you guys have the courage and fortitude to swim against the tide because just about every kid I teach in school has been indoctrinated already by the left values. So congratulations to you guys. Some advice, some advice for Danny and for Liam. Can you stop recruiting from the letter J and move on from there, please? Because I think I noticed that there was about three or four Js in that group. So move on to the Ks and the Ls. I'm sure you'll get more people to come along. I have a question for Lyle because I am a school teacher and he hasn't done anything all night. Lyle, I'd like to know if you have any views. I know that when I engage, engage people from the left and with their views, they are, um, their, their modus operandi is to criticise and name call and things like that. And it's very difficult when you know that you have the answers, when you know that you have the facts to refute their arguments, that they just won't let you. All they do is, is yell. The only engagement I heard tonight that you guys seem to get is Danny's engagement on her post about abortion and your engagement from some idiot in a, in a, a truck with a, with a gas cylinder in it. And that's not really the kind of engagement that's going to do probably not much for us. 
how do we get that opportunity? How do these young people get that opportunity to talk um, to people and to um, show the facts and show that, that Australian society is under threat, that Australian democracy and freedoms are under threat and that uh, we need to, to get on board now because it's, can, it's accelerating as it moves to the left. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, well said. Um, yeah, this is something that's very close to my heart. I alluded to, alluded to it in my talk. Um, this idea that you can just close down a debate by calling someone a name, um, I think all of us have talked about this tonight, it, it really is a toxic thing in our culture and it, it's bred um, an intellectual laziness uh, and it's uh, stopped the ability of people to think through deep issues. Um, I'm very passionate about a lot of things but I'm concerned about our economy and uh, our electricity and I just can't believe that in a country like Australia that we have trouble keeping the lights on in summer um, and yet we have more coal than just about any other country. We've got hundreds and hundreds of years supply and yet um, you're called a denier if you question anthropogenic climate change. Now that, that use of the term denier is quite deliberate by the left because it evokes um, the, the Holocaust. And uh, so the idea that you are doing something really evil uh, for the sake of humanity and genocidal by, by daring to question this. So we've had bad public policy uh, as a result of this uh, inability uh, to think through and to interrogate debates and, and claims that are being made uh, properly and it's hurting our economy. And, you know, we go to the gender issue as well. Um, it goes on and on. So somehow we've got to break through this nexus. Um, we've got to call out the people that are, are just using these slurs uh, and, and make them do the intellectual hard work. Um, I, I think that's the best way. And then when, the, when they are criticising and vilifying us, I think we've got to be able to, to take it with great grace and then to push back with grace without anger and um, we've got a real problem with the public discourse in our country but I think um, you know I love the way Corey engages uh, Miranda and others there's many voices uh, in the in this new emerging conservative movement but uh, it's not we're not going to win the day by getting angry as much as we can be justified about that uh, we've got to respond with grace and then we've got to demand that they unpack uh, whatever slur they throw at us uh, and explain themselves. Now there's, uh, th this will be the uh, last question. So if you're not already in the queue, um, we'll uh, wrap the note up on time. My question's for Lyle as well. Um, I was just reading on Facebook uh, today that Labor is announcing a new Bill of Rights, which contains a right to life protection from torture and cruelty, inhumane or degrading treatment, freedom of expression and peaceful assembly. And this is a couple of weeks after everything's happened with abortion. So I just wanted your comments on that. No, thank you for that. You're referring to uh, something that was announced yesterday by the State Attorney General, Yvette Darth. Um, it's essentially a, a Bill of Rights or a Charter of Rights, and it all sounds good. I mean, who's not against free speech and the right to life? And you're right, it is incredibly ironic when <laughs> the same government has just passed uh, abortion to birth legislation, no questions asked up to 22 weeks, and then a tick and a flick from uh, a second doctor uh, beyond 22 weeks. And yet this charter sounds all, all noble. Um, I've spent uh, two years of my life campaigning against a federal version of this when uh, Kevin Rudd was Prime Minister. Uh, I was involved in a coalition of people that included um, Bob Carr, of all people, um, who, who fought against us. I'm sure Corey was involved as well. Um, and certainly the, the Liberals were opposed to it. Um, but uh, these charters of rights, what they do uh, is that they allow judges essentially to issue declarations of incompatibility from the bench about legislation. And so they essentially become de facto legislators. Now, they'll tell you that the parliament has overall control, but um, where these bills of rights have been introduced in other countries, um, parliaments haven't gone against what the judges have said. So it all sounds nice about free speech and all of this sort of thing, but it, it comes down to a judge's interpretation of this. And it, it, it really is leading to the Americanization of our judicial system. And someone raised Justice Kavanaugh earlier. Uh, the Supreme Court has been legislating from the bench in America for a long time, supposedly in the name of all these wonderful free speech. They, they found a, a right to abortion you know, in, the, in, the free, in the Constitution because of 
uh, the American judicial system. They found a right to redefine marriage somehow as a result of uh, what the judges decided, not through the democratic process in America. And so that's why I'm very much against what the Queensland government has introduced. It must be opposed. Um, they'll dress it up in all this fine sounding rhetoric. Uh, we already have these freedoms now. We don't need to subject those freedoms to the interpretation of people in black robes on the bench. Uh, yeah, a million reasons why I'm stoked for you guys and happy to support the Conservatives, so I just want to thank you very much. Um, my question is uh, related to, like when you travel and you speak to people about Australians, we're considered to be these really hardy, tough, pioneering people. Um, but I guess in my experience, I'm just sort of saying that's not actually true anymore. I think we're you know, really amongst the softest people on earth in so many different ways that it's just deeply embarrassing, and, and particularly when you run to people overseas and they think that we're all that, but the reality is we're so much more inept. Um, I think my question relates to, I guess, safety, I suppose, and what I see, I know it's, it's quite specific, but um, this whole idea of Australia becoming a nanny state, and it was one of the things which initially um, drew me to your website, actually, Corey, was this idea of common sense and the fact that it's an eroding, dying commodity and it's a muscle that if we don't exercise it, we don't seem to, we're losing it. And, uh, and I think from my line of work, um, you know, I just see the cost that it adds to business and just generally getting anything done in this country is just ridiculous. And um, obviously over-regulation generally, but specifically you know, how much it is to do anything because we're, we're just so soft and hopeless. So uh, given that, uh, again, looking at sort of the policy pillars of, you know, private enterprise, common sense, personal responsibility, it seems to me that most people I speak to agree that it's out of control. Um, and whilst we do have people which are willing to happily attack the unions and the, and the role that I suppose they've had in propagating a lot of this and, and the absurdity which, which businessmen have to deal with, particularly in construction, um, it seems to me that there is some available space for a party like us where it lines up with so much of what we agree with, whether it's an intention to, to be more active in, in calling it out. Great comment. Um, can I thank you for that? What you're describing is that society becomes a bit soggy and as soon as you were talking about it, I, it took me back to when I was in Europe and when The Economist was a right-wing magazine and I would read it and back in 1988 and there was a, a little column in there by a bloke who was a former editor of The Economist called Nico Colchester and it was just a few hundred words and it just said, "Keeping keep things crunchy and it talked about how a society that's crunchy has consequences, it has rights and wrongs, it has um, uh, opportunities, but if you fail, well, you know, you're going to end up on the other side of the divide. And as prosperity comes into a society and as governments make decisions and voters realise that they can force governments to make decisions, society becomes a bit soggy. They try and mitigate this, the, the consequence of the action. They'll, they'll, if you don't insure your house and it burns down, well, oh, well, we'll pick it up. It wasn't your fault. It was, you know, our fault. Um, they'll put mattresses down and uh, for everything in case you fall over and, and hurt yourself. And, and that's where the nanny state comes from. And so how do you fight back against it? Firstly, I'd encourage you to get the column. I've still got the original paper. I tore it out in the, from 1988. I tore it out uh, and... I've still got it framed in my in my office, and it was the very first blog I ever wrote back in 2009. Was about this Nico Colchester to keep things crunchy, because it, it was I just find it inspiring even today, um, and that's what we need to do. We need to bring back that sense of personal responsibility and say, well, well, actions have consequences. You're free to choose, but don't expect people to pick up the bill when it doesn't work for you. And I, I take another leaf out of Trump's book uh, that he said every regulation that's going in, there's two coming out. Why can't we do that? We had deregulation days in Australia. And you know what they were? Correcting grammatical errors in, 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 um, in volumes of, of uh, legislation that don't even apply anymore. Uh, it's just a, it's crazy. We should be just saying, how do we stop, how do we stop the impediments to business? Um, if you want to do the wrong thing in your business, I don't know what business you're in, but if you want to do the wrong thing in your business, get on with it and do it and suffer the consequences of it afterwards, you know? And just we can't legislate for bad, every bit of bad behaviour. We shouldn't be legislating to, to prop up um, 
or to, to dumb everyone down to the lowest common denominator. What we should be doing is freeing people from the shackles of it to let them to be all they can be and helping those who, who really need a, a leg up. So as far as your business is concerned, I'd say government needs to get out of the way and, um, and you should do what you want. And if you do the wrong thing and you break the law, well, you know, suffer the consequences of it. It's uh, more fool you. Awesome. Has been some good questions tonight, some interesting conversations. Uh, Miranda, um, Miranda got cranky at me on Twitter this week because uh, she, she said something about Turnbull derangement syndrome. Um, now, I've, I, I don't even know what that is. I, uh, she got cranky at me because I said, that's not a thing. Um, let's, uh, yeah, it's, that's, that's kind of what I said. It's accurate, but it's talking about him. Not, but, uh, so my question is, there's heaps of your detractors that have a, a common criticism, and that is that because you're not a fan of returning Tony Abbott to the Prime Ministership, therefore you're deeply affectionate for Malcolm Turnbull. Exactly what are your views on his performance as Prime Minister? Well, thank you for that. And when, when Dave said um, I got cranky with him, I wrote one word on Twitter. I go, seriously? <laughs> because, I felt chagrined. Because, um, look, I just made up this thing about Turnbull derangement syndrome, um, you know, mirroring the Trump derangement syndrome, and obviously they're completely opposite characters. But, but the point is that I think that conservatives lost the plot because instead of looking at who the real enemy was, as in Labor and Bill Shorten, they just used all their genius for bile and invective against the leader of their own party. And whether they liked him or not, he was the Prime Minister. He won an election. So I just, I watch, you know, today, th this week is a perfect example. So I go through, why, why am I the only person that's gone through and deconstructed the Labor Party platform? So I did that. I put it out there. And, you know, there was, there was a lot of, uh, you know, talk about it on Sky News and 2GB and so on. But what they were really exercised about all week was Malcolm Turnbull going to Indonesia. Move on. The guy is no longer the Prime Minister. They're in the, the fight. Conservatives, if they call themselves conservatives in the media, and that's who I'm mainly aiming that at, um, they need to get on board and realise that they're in the fight of their life. They got rid of their man. Just stop talking about him. He goes on Q&A. Who cares? Ignore him. He's nobody anymore. Well said. Well, to thank our speakers and to wrap up the evening, I'd like to invite Liam from the Young Conservatives back to the stage. Before I give the thanks to everyone, I'll just quickly go through if you want to... Sorry, that was Danny's comments on her abortion video. But if you want to get involved more, we have a launch party uh, tomorrow night, 7pm, the Norman Hotel. We also have our Facebook, which will tomorrow be changed to Young Conservatives Queensland. That's our email address up there. And if you're keen to get involved, I'll see you tomorrow night. So I'd like to, uh, on behalf of Young Conservatives Queensland, thank Lyle Shelton, Miranda Devine, Corey Bernardi and Danny Stars for being our speakers tonight. <laughs> I'd like to also thank Simon Green and Dave Pello for helping out and being the MC in the Q&A uh, for tonight as well. And thank you for the young conservatives involved and everyone for coming and attending tonight. So I hope you all enjoyed it.